Well, let me see a show of hands. How many of you are fans of the Texas Tech Red Raiders? Hands up if you are a Red Raider, okay? All right, good. How many of you have been fans of Texas Tech for, uh, let's say 10 years plus? Let me see your hands, over 10 years, okay? Uh, 20 years, let me see your hands, okay? All right, going down a little bit. 30 years, let me see your hands. Okay, there's, there's a few of us, all right, I'm in that camp, okay? I've lived here almost my whole life. All right, any 40 year Red Raiders fans? Okay, I'm almost there. I, I, I'm approaching 40 and I've been a Red Raider from birth, okay? I was born with like a black and red onesie or something, you know, I don't know. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been a Red Raider my whole life. I'm a, I'm a fan. And if you're a fan of Texas Tech and if you've been that way for five, 10, 20 years, you, you know this to be true. Uh, the fandom of being a Texas Tech Red Raider, like, being a fan of Texas Tech means you're going to be on a roller coaster of emotions, right? I mean, in the national championship, it's the highest of highs. And my brothers and I are shaking each other saying, we're going to win a national championship. And then a couple of minutes later, I mean, it's just tears and brokenness and your hearts are shattered, right? I mean, it's the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. You know, quite, quite literally, this past week or two has been the same way. You know, Beardley's, uh, Adams gets hired, players and in and out in and out of the portal. I mean, it just kind of messes with your emotions, right? If you're, a, if you're a Red Raider fan, if you really care, okay? Then there's another level of fandom for the Red Raiders. You know, there, there's some of us that are fans. We, we bought the, the shirt, we got the hat, maybe because we live in Lubbock or, or whatever. But then there's another level of people who, you know, travel to the games and uh, sacrifice in order to, uh, you know, to have season tickets or, you know, their, their emotions are tied up, you know, in what 18 year old kids do on a court or a field. And so, so they, they have good days and bad days and good weeks and bad weeks. And, and I've told you before, and we go to church or don't go to church based upon how the Red Raiders are doing, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the level of some people's fandom for Texas Tech. Then, there, then there's a whole other level of being a Red Raider, and that's if you're a player. You're actually on the field. You're a donor. You're, you're given money to help pay for all these facilities and stadiums and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're giving to, of yourself. You're, you're sacrificing in order to, to give. You're, you're, you're a donor or you're a player. You're, you're showing up and, and you know, beating your body and training your body and, and practicing day in and day out to be on that team. That, that's a different level of commitment. It just is. And in the same way, there's, there's different levels of commitments when it comes to, to following Jesus. And we see this in the scripture. Jesus had lots of fans. Crowds followed him everywhere he went because he was healing people and, and feeding people. And when Jesus is saying good things and nice things and he, he's doing things for you, uh, the, the crowds are following him. They, they love him. They had fans. They were fans of Jesus. And for this series that we're starting today called The Twelve, it's going to be a short series. We're going to look at the lives of a couple of the disciples. It's a, it's a series we'll come back to uh, over the years until we cover all of them. But for this series, here's, here's how we're going to define a fan. A fan is an enthusiastic admirer. Now, if you're following along in the app, here's where you take notes and you fill in the blank. Download our app if you haven't done that. The City Church Lubbock, the verses and the points are all there for you. Uh, so you can follow along in the scripture and fill in the blank and email yourself those notes when you're done. But, but for our purposes, here's what we're gonna say. A fan is an enthusiastic admirer. And Jesus had lots of these, thousands upon thousands of these. Crowds followed him everywhere he went as he invited them to come and see the good things he had to say and the good things that he could do for them, like heal them and feed them. Well, in John chapter six, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And, and most scholars will tell us that it's actually probably closer to 15,000 when you count women and children. It's a lot of people. So Jesus feeds all of them miraculously and they love him. They're, they're fans. They enthusiastically admire Jesus for all that he's doing and saying and all the good things that he's doing for them. But then the message starts to get a little bit harder. The preaching starts to get a little bit harder. And Jesus says things like, I'm the bread of life. I'm living water. If you eat from me, if you drink from me, you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst again. And, and here's what he was saying by default. Everything else that you give yourself to and you pursue will leave you empty and hungry and thirsting for more. But if you will come to me and follow me, 
then you will never hunger again. You will never thirst again because you were created and designed for a relationship with God through me. And so in following me, he would say, you're finding the purpose for which you were created and your soul at its deepest level will be satisfied and fulfilled and you will know a peace that surpasses all understanding and that doesn't rise and fall necessarily with the good times and the bad times in this life because I'm the bread of life, I'm the living water. You'll never hunger again, you'll never thirst again. And it says at the end of this teaching, many in the crowd begin to say, wow, this is hard, this is a hard teaching. Like we liked what you were saying, come and see, and you were doing all the good things for us, but now you're telling us we have, we're, we're gonna follow you and we've gotta eat from you and drink from you and, and have this relationship with you. And, and now you're telling us you're gonna have to take up your cross and, and die to yourself and deny yourself and, and follow me. That's getting a little bit hard, Jesus. And it says in John chapter six that many in the crowds turned away from him. Many of the crowds turned their backs on him and they no longer followed him, but the 12, his disciples, continued to follow him in spite of the cost. And even when things got difficult and even when the preaching got harder, they followed him. You see, the Greek word for disciple is methetes, and it means a disciplined follower. A fan is an enthusiastic admirer, but a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is a disciplined follower. This is a methetes, this is a disciple, a disciplined follower of a leader or a way or a system. Broadly speaking, that's what it is. That's what a methetes is, that's what a disciple is. It's a disciplined follower. And so the disciples, the 12, move from being fans, enthusiastic admirers, to being disciples dedicated, devoted, disciplined followers of their rabbi, of their Lord, of their teacher. They made, they made that move from fan, enthusiastic admirer, just one in the crowd, to being a, a follower, a disciple, a methetes. And it was said in this day about a disciple who followed a rabbi this is, what they, they, this is the blessing they would speak over you as a disciple. They would say, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And here, here, here's what this means. Here's what they were saying. May you follow your rabbi, your teacher, your, your Lord. May, may you follow them so closely and so nearly and so passionately that as they walk in the dirt and kick up dust from their sandals and feet hitting that ground, and don't we know that in West Texas? Everywhere you walk, dust flies up, right? I mean, that's just what happens, okay? So may the dust of your rabbi be on your feet, that, that blessing, here, here's what it meant. May you follow your teacher, your rabbi, so closely that as he kicks up dust walking, it falls on your feet because you are so near, you are so close to your rabbi that even the dust that he kicks up as he walks falls on your feet. May the dust of your rabbi be upon you. May you be covered in their dust. And that's what the disciples did as they moved from fans to followers. They completely reoriented their lives around following Jesus. And so in this series, we're looking at these 12 who were covered in the dust of their rabbi, Jesus. We're looking at their lives, their faith, their, their failures, and ultimately their martyrdom as they all died saying they were followers of Jesus who saw Jesus risen from the grave. So if you got your Bible, go to John 11. John chapter 20, we're looking today at Thomas. And the reason we're choosing Thomas first is that Thomas did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus at first. And maybe you've been there before, you, you didn't believe, or maybe you're there now and you don't believe. And my, my hope is, my, my prayer is that as you see Thomas and the life and the faith of Thomas and the reason why Thomas gave his life to Jesus and believed that Jesus died and rose again, maybe that will, maybe that will speak to you and you will connect with Thomas. One of the only disciples out of the 12 that did not believe at first. Everyone else was seeing Jesus and they were telling Thomas that Jesus had risen from the grave and Thomas didn't buy it. And so over the years, you may have heard him referred to as Doubting Thomas. Thomas gets a kind of a bad rap because that's not really the case with, with Thomas. Yes, he was a skeptic, but as you're about to see, Thomas had a deep love and admiration and passion for Jesus. 
that went so much further than just being a fan. So look with me here in John chapter 11. Let me set this for, up for you. Uh, Jesus is going to lay, raise Lazarus from the grave. That means going back to Judea, specifically Bethany, where he and the disciples had almost been stoned to death. And so Jesus saying they're going to Bethany to raise Lazarus is freaking the disciples out. They're like, Jesus, that's a bad idea. Have you lost your mind? Because they nearly killed us the last time we were in Bethany. And Bethany, where we're headed, is inside of the temple where Jesus' worst enemies are. And so Jesus is saying, we're going into the lion's den, folks. We're going right back to where they nearly stoned us. And we're pretty much going up onto the doorstep of those that would like to kill us. And the disciples are like, wait, Jesus, uh, we're not sure this is a good idea. And here's what Thomas says in response to Jesus saying, we're going back to Bethany to raise Lazarus. Here's what John, or, or Thomas says in John chapter 11. He says this, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said this to his fellow disciples, let's go too. If that's where Jesus is going, that's where we're going. Let's go too, watch this, and die with Jesus. Thomas was convinced that if he was going to follow his rabbi, if the dust of his rabbi was gonna get on his feet, it was going to mean in this moment, dying with Jesus. That, that's how convinced he was. Jesus, if that's where you're going, that's where we're going too, but let's go. Come on, guys, let's go. He's saying to the 12, let's go. We're gonna go die with Jesus. He knew full well what it meant and what the cost was of following Jesus and getting the dust of his rabbi on his feet. He knew the cost. He counted the cost and he said, let's go die with him. This is fearless, Thomas. This says if Jesus dies, we're gonna die with him. Thomas did not wanna be separate from his Jesus. In John chapter 14, when Jesus tells his disciples, hey guys, I'm gonna die. Uh, I'm gonna be raised again in three days. He, he predicted his own death and resurrection. He, he said, hey, after that, I'm gonna go back to the Father. I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And you remember what Thomas says? Thomas says, Jesus, we, we don't know where you're going and uh, we, we need you to tell us the way so that where you are, we can be with you because we wanna be with you. We wanna go with you. So, so don't tell us that you're leaving without us to tell us how to get where you're going because we're following you regardless of the cost. We want to be with you. Thomas would rather die with Christ than live without him. That's devotion, friends. That's passion on a level most of us cannot even begin to understand. That is commitment. That's not being a fan. That's being a follower. That's getting the dust of your rabbi on your feet. Well, a little later, Jesus dies. He rises from the grave. He starts appearing to all of his disciples. They're all believing. They're telling everyone. They're telling Thomas. Thomas hasn't seen Jesus yet, and he won't believe it. He's like, no, no, no I'm not going to believe unless I can touch his hands and touch his side and see for myself that he has been risen from the grave. And so Thomas doesn't believe it. He, he, he's broken. He's feeling betrayed. He's feeling disillusioned because the one he believes so firmly and so confidently in has died. He's dead and he's in a tomb. And so in John chapter 20, verse 24, it says this, one of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. So, so Jesus is appearing to his disciples and, because they're all together and he's appearing to different ones of them, but Thomas is nowhere to be found. And, and so he wasn't there. He didn't get to see Jesus. And so they're all telling him about Jesus. So he wasn't there. They told him, that's Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He's risen from the grave. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it. I won't believe it unless I see it. And maybe you've been there before too, or maybe you're there right now. I'm not gonna believe it unless I see something, unless God proves himself to me. I'm not gonna believe it unless I see it. So maybe you connect with Thomas in this way. I'm not gonna believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Where was Thomas? Thomas was fearless, now he's faithless, he's hopeless. Thomas probably just wanted to be alone. No doubt feeling betrayed, rejected, forsaken. The one he had loved so deeply was gone, was dead, and it tore his heart out. He wasn't in the mood to be with other people or to socialize. He's brokenhearted, shattered, devastated, crushed. He just wanted to be alone. He couldn't take 
the banter. He wasn't in the mood to be in a, a crowd or to even be with his friends and, and fake it when they would ask him, hey man, how, how's it going? How's your week been? Thomas didn't want to say, oh, it's good. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay. He, he didn't have the energy to fake it, right? To, to, to give the platitudes that, that you and I so often give. Oh, I'm fine. It's okay. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm blessed. <laughs> he didn't have the energy for that. He, he couldn't be fake right now. He was totally devastated and he didn't want to be with his friends. Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. Now, maybe he, he's starting to wonder, man, that they are really convinced that they've seen Jesus risen from the grave, that they really believe this. Maybe there's something to this, okay? Eight days later, maybe some of the pain and the hurt has resided a little bit, and now he's willing to, to go out and to be with his friends. So, so eight days later, Thomas is with them this time. The doors were locked. The disciples were scared. They were afraid that they were going to be next, that the Pharisees, the Romans were, were going to come for them. That's why Paul, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. Hey, you're, you're one of those Jesus followers. No, I don't even know him. He, he was scared. He, he didn't want to die the death he knew Jesus was going to die. He, he was scared in this moment. After Jesus dies, they're all scared. They all think they're, they're probably coming for them next. And so they're, they're huddled together. They're meeting together under fear of death and they're locking the doors. But then suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side where the, where the spear went in. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And I, I believe that's what Jesus is calling out and challenging you and I with today. Don't be faithless. Believe. Maybe you're here today and you've, you've never believed. But today, I want you to hear Jesus saying, believe, believe in me, trust me today. P uh, Thomas replies, look at this confession. My Lord and my God, you're God. You rose from the grave. I can, I can see it now. You are God. You are who you said you were. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. But watch this. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's you and me. Jesus, how crazy is this, was thinking of you and me. Thomas, you believe because you've seen. But blessed are those who will believe without seeing. I want you to see today, we have a very reasonable faith. This isn't a blind faith. I don't believe what I believe because my parents told me or because it's what I always was told growing up or because this is what a, a pastor told me. I, I, I went through years where I, I wasn't too sure about all of this. When I, got, uh, when I was graduating from high school, when I went into college, I started studying all of this. Why, why do I believe this? Why, why do I really believe this is, this is true? I mean, I'm really believing that there was a dead man and now he's alive and, and he's still alive. We have a very reasonable Faith, this is not a blind faith. We have evidence, historical evidence that I'm gonna show you today and you're gonna see more in this series. We have historical evidence that points to a resurrection. This is not a blind faith. It is very, very reasonable. Now, not raising someone from the dead, that's a little unreasonable. I get that, okay? That seems a little weird, okay? But the evidence that points to it is very reasonable. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, you're a Christian because you believe Jesus rose from the grave. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian and you want to become a Christian, becoming a Christian means you believe literally that someone died, a person died, and then three days later came back to life. That's what, that's what Christians believe. And Paul said it like this, the, the resurrection is the central Event. It's a historical event, a, the central event around which all of Christianity is based. It all rises and falls on the resurrection. So much so that Paul said this, if Christ wasn't raised, then our preaching is useless, our faith is useless, and you are wasting your time. And so am I. If Christ hasn't been raised, we're, we're all wasting our time. That, that's what we believe, folks, that, that a dead man died and came back to life. And if that hadn't happened, then this is pointless. There's no use in going through the motions and singing the songs and praying the prayers and reading the Bible and all these kinds of, it's pointless, Paul said, if Christ has not been raised. But Paul believed he had. And you're gonna see in just a second, Thomas obviously believed that he had. 
And we can prove that Thomas believed it. And we can prove that the disciples believed it. That they saw Jesus risen from the dead. Jesus says, blessed are those who see without believing. Thomas got to see and then, then he believed. And Thomas was a follower of Jesus. He, he loved Jesus. He didn't want to get his hopes up. He didn't believe at first. But then he saw and now he's believing. And Jesus shows up and he immediately brings answers to Thomas's doubt. He meets him right where he's at. The scripture says this about God, that his eyes are like fire. And he not only sees everything you've ever done, he sees everything you've ever thought and every motivation and intention of your heart. He sees it all. He sees right past the religious exterior. He sees right past the I'm fines and I'm blessed and all that. He sees right past all of that. And he sees your hearts because his eyes are like fire. So when Jesus shows up, Thomas hadn't even asked a question yet. And Jesus says, Thomas meets him right where he's at in his unbelief and his doubt. He says, Thomas, touch my hands, touch my side. You see, Jesus will meet you right where you're at and reveal yourself to him and draw yourself to him. And so he stretches out his hand and says, Peter, look, it's the, it's the nail hands. See, see the wounds in my hands, it's where the nails went. See, see the, the, the wound in my side, it's where the spear went. Touch and see it. And, and Thomas reached out and touched. And Jesus said, ow, that hurts. No, that's not what happened. And then, and then Jesus says, hey, touch the wound in my side. And he, and he said, Thomas, are you crazy? Why would you do that? Why, why would you touch the wound in my side? That hurts. You see, that's not what happened. When I was in college doing my degree in, in Christian ministry, one of the projects and presentations I had to give was to examine and study all the alternate theories to the resurrection. I had to study all of them. And then I had to present each one and the case for each of these alternate theories and then disprove every single one of them through the historical evidence we have for the resurrection. And so, so I did that in college. It was a, it was a wonderful project. I, I, I loved it. And one of the theories, because you have to do something with the resurrection, folks. You can't, you, you can't just kind of ignore it. We, we, Christians say a dead man rose from the grave. He, he conquered death. And that when they die, they're, they're, they're going to heaven. And then if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. I mean, that's, that's big stuff. You, you, you have to deal with that. You, you have to figure that out. Did, did this man really rise from the grave, like they're, like they're saying, or, or not? And so these theories, these alternate theories have come up, and one of them is called the swoon theory which says this, Jesus didn't really die and, uh, and, and was raised again. He, he just never was really dead. He, he never died. And so he was a bloody, beaten, bruised, barely alive on life support Jesus. And the disciples saw him and thought that he had risen from the grave, but he didn't really, he didn't really die. He was just almost dead. Okay, so that, that's one of the big theories. That's one of the major theories uh, to uh, combat the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Here's the problem with that. That would not have convinced Thomas. He would have said, God, Jesus is bloody on the floor. I mean, he's, he's dragging himself into the house, right? He's barely alive. He, he's, he's bloody and bruised and maimed. I mean, he's barely, he's not, he's not risen from the dead. He's barely alive. That wouldn't have convinced Thomas. That wouldn't have convinced James, the brother of Jesus and the other brothers of Jesus who thought Jesus was out of his mind because he was claiming to be God. They, they thought he was crazy until they saw him risen from the grave. And then all of them, James, Jude, and the other brothers ended up saying Jesus is God and they believed that their brother was in fact God and that he rose from the grave and they died as martyrs preaching that that they eyewitnessed their brother rising from the grave. Listen, a bloody, bruised, on life support, barely alive Jesus would not have convinced Thomas, would not have convinced James and the other brothers of Jesus, and it wouldn't have convinced Paul who hated Jesus and didn't even believe that Jesus was a good teacher, thought he was nuts, thought he was a blasphemer. They wouldn't have convinced Paul. So, so all these theories, alternate theories to, to the resurrection, they just don't hold water. We'll get to some more here in just a second. So 
Jesus wasn't barely alive. No, he was in this powerful, glorified, resurrected body. And when Thomas sees this risen Jesus from the dead and he touches this risen Jesus from the dead, Thomas says this, my Lord and my God. What an amazing confession saying, Jesus, you are God. If he was bloody and dying still on the ground from the resurrection and from the beating he took, Thomas isn't gonna look at a half dead Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. No, 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 no. Thomas saw a risen, powerful, very much alive, resurrected in a glorified body, the Bible tells us. And he sees Jesus and he says, this is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is God in the flesh, my Lord and my God. He's saying, Jesus, you rose from the dead. And so you're God, you are who you said you were. You said that you and the Father are one. You said that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father and I I believe it. I believed it before, but then I lost faith because you died, but now I can tell you, you are who you said you were all along. You are God. You see, it's been said that Jesus is either a liar, he was saying he was God and he knew he wasn't and he was lying. He's a lunatic, like his brothers and family thought, Like, you don't get to just walk around saying you're God, Jesus, you know? I had a man tell me one time that he was Jesus. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, no, yeah, I'm I'm Jesus. And I said, no, you're not. (laughs) You're not Jesus, right? Because if someone tells you they're Jesus or if someone tells you they're God, you you think they've lost their mind. People don't go around and say, say they're God without garnering some attention and some derision, right? You don't just get to go around doing that. And so Jesus' brothers thought he was crazy. He was a lunatic. He was saying he was God. He was saying he was equal with the Father, with God. And so they thought he was crazy. You would too if your brother said he was God. You wouldn't believe him. You'd think he's nuts. His family thought he was nuts. So he was a liar. He was a lunatic or he's Lord. And he is who he says he is. He is God. He and the Father are one. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. There's only three choices. Jesus, guys, get this in. You gotta understand. Jesus was not a good teacher. He wasn't a good moral teacher. You don't get that option. Because a good moral teacher doesn't go around saying they're God. They're either lying and they know they're not, or they're a lunatic, they're crazy. Or they are who they say they are and they're God. So he's a liar, he's lunatic, or he's Lord. And Thomas looks at Jesus and says, you are Lord. Only God could do something like that. So I'm not following any other religious leader. I'm not following any other prophet. I'm not following any other religion because you rose from the grave. And so I'm going with you. I'm going with the one who rose from the grave. You're who I'm trusting in. You're who I'm giving my life to, my Lord and my God. Jesus convinced Thomas that there was zero reason to doubt that he was alive. And Jesus said, because you have seen, you believe. You believe because you've seen. But Thomas didn't believe until after he saw. But after he saw, he went everywhere telling everyone that in fact, Jesus had risen from the grave. Thomas was convinced that Jesus was alive. Thomas was convinced because of what he saw with his own eyes and touched with his own hands. Watch this, this is 1 John chapter one. John, another disciple, speaking on behalf of the disciples, he's saying this, we are proclaiming to you, that, that's the we, that's the disciples, the apostles, the ones who saw Jesus risen from the grave. We are proclaiming to you the one who existed from the beginning. So John's saying, let's, 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 let's not parse or mince words here, okay? We're saying this man is God. We're proclaiming to you the one who existed from the beginning. What John is saying here, we're talking about the one who existed before everything else existed. We're talking about what scientists call the uncaused cause who existed in the very beginning before the universe existed, before mankind existed. He's saying we're we're talking about, here's who we're talking about, the one who's always existed, the one who existed in the very beginning, was already alive, was already conscious. And he says this, John says, we saw him. It's talking about Jesus who has always existed, who is God. We saw him, watch this, with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. We proclaim to you, watch this, what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, John says. No one else told us this. We saw this ourselves, John says. That's what what Thomas would say. We we, we saw with our eyes, we touched with our hands. So so here's what didn't happen. Here's what John is saying to you and I. 
It wasn't my friends, 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 sister-in-law, uh, friends, brother-in-law that told us that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. That, that, that's not what happened. Uh, John here is not saying, my parents told me when I was growing up that Jesus rose from the grave and their parents told them and, and their parents told them. This wasn't a tradition that was passed down yet. This wasn't a story that, that was being told to other people yet. Thomas is saying, we're the ones who saw him. We were in the position to know if this is true or false. We were eyewitnesses. Do, do you get how that's totally different than someone who's heard something, than from someone like you and I who has believed something that's been written in the scripture, who has been passed down, even with good reasons? That's totally different. They're saying we were in the position to know if this was true or false. We were the eyewitnesses. And when they saw Jesus risen from the grave, they began, as he says in, 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 in 1 John 1 verse 1, they began to proclaim this Jesus who rose from the grave and is God. They began to preach about Jesus. And all of the disciples went everywhere telling people about Jesus and making disciples and planting churches. And, and, and the numbers of believers were growing exponentially by the thousands upon thousands upon thousands in the days of the early church as everyone was talking about this man who died and rose again. And everyone was, was by, by the multitudes, they, they were placing their faith in this Jesus who rose again and claimed to be God. They, they went everywhere doing this. I mean, their lives were totally changed. They're scared, locked in a room, but, but now they're, they're going everywhere preaching about this Jesus and, and they're, they're dying as martyrs saying they eyewitnessed Jesus risen from the grave. I mean, what's changed? Peter was so scared, he denied that he even knew Jesus to a little girl. That's how scared he was. But Jesus, Peter sees Jesus risen from the grave and in Acts chapter two, it says this about Peter. Peter stood up, he raises his voice, he addresses the crowd, he starts preaching and he tells that crowd, you guys are the ones that put the son of God on the cross. You did it. But now he's risen from the grave and the crowd is so freaked out. They're so convicted of their sin. They said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, give your lives to Jesus, repent of your sin and give your life to Jesus. I mean, are you seeing the change that took place in Peter from some sort of scared, faithless, full of fear to someone who is bold and fearless and preaching about Jesus now, even willing to die for Jesus? He did. How do you explain that change? These men, Thomas, these women, they saw Jesus risen from the grave and they went everywhere telling people about Jesus. We know from sources outside the Bible, there was Jewish and Roman historians that chronicled the lives of the disciples and, and the way they died. And here's what we know about Thomas. Thomas went to India to preach the gospel. In fact, to this day, there's a small here, a hill near the airport in Chennai, India, where Thomas is said to have been buried. There are churches in South India whose roots are traceable to the beginning of the church age and tradition says they were founded under the ministry of Thomas. But as Thomas kept preaching and making disciples and planting churches, he faced some opposition as all of the 12 did. And he was told to stop and he was told to leave and he didn't and he kept preaching about Jesus and so they killed him. Thomas died as a martyr in India by being speared. They tied him down and they threw spears at him until he died. Kind of a fitting martyrdom, don't you think? For the man whose faith was ignited by touching the side, the wound, where the spear went into Jesus. Thomas lived a good life and he died a, a great death. Because Thomas loved has risen Jesus. Nobody dies for something they know to be a lie. P people die for things today for something they were told, and, and Christians do too. They, they die all over the world today for something they were told, for something they've read in the scripture, for something they believed to be true. But no one dies for something they know is a lie. It's been said, and I believe this to be true, that liars make bad martyrs. Liars 
make very bad martyrs because no one dies as a martyr for something they know to be a lie. When you're in the position to know if something was true or false, you don't die for something when you know you're telling a lie. No one does. And certainly not 12 and certainly not hundreds. Watch this. First Corinthians 15 says this, that over 500 people saw Jesus at one time. One of those alternate theories to the resurrection is that the disciples were hallucinating. They hallucinated Jesus being risen from the dead. Well, one person can hallucinate something. 12 people don't get to hallucinate the exact same team at the, thing at the exact same time. 500 people at one time don't hallucinate the exact same thing at the exact same time. That's not a hallucination, friend. That's a historical event. They did not hallucinate this. Hallucinations wouldn't have convinced Tom or, or Thomas or James, the brother of Jesus, or Paul. These are not hallucinations. 500 people saw Jesus at one time. They were in a position to know whether Jesus had actually, in fact, risen from the grave. So here's my first big idea for you. Here's my first takeaway. We can believe without seeing, as Jesus said, because Thomas believed after seeing. We can believe without seeing because Thomas believed, Peter believed, James believed, John believed, they believed after seeing, so you and I can believe without seeing. Because not only do they believe, but they begin to preach and to tell other people about the resurrection of Jesus, and they died as martyrs saying they eyewitnessed this. Listen, scholars do not debate that it is a historical fact that all of the disciples died as martyrs believing Jesus rose from the grave. Now, many will say we, we don't believe that he did, but no serious person, no scholar debates that the disciples died as martyrs believing that Jesus rose from the grave. So when we look at the lives of the disciples and so many others that died as martyrs saying they were eyewitnesses and they saw Jesus risen from the dead and we take every other alternate theory to the resurrection because you gotta deal with this somehow and, and we see that none of them really hold water, then all of the evidence that we do have points to a resurrection. And the disciples were so convinced of the resurrection that they were willing to die. They were willing to die saying, we saw him. We touched him. We ate with him. Over 500 of us saw him at one time. Acts chapter one says he spent a period of 40 days with the disciples, eating with them, talking with them, drinking with them. And so the disciples being convinced of the resurrection, they moved from come and see to come and die. They, they move from being enthusiastic admirers to disciplined followers. They move from being fans to followers, convinced of the resurrection. They were willing to live and die for Christ. That's a good life. That's a good death. You see, the culture today will tell you that life is found in self-actualization, finding yourself, being yourself, embracing yourself. The culture today, the world will tell you that you've got to work harder at finding you or, or being you. Jesus didn't say, come follow me and find yourself. Jesus didn't say, come follow me and embrace yourself. Come follow me and love yourself. Come follow me and find yourself. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, come follow me and die to yourself. Deny yourself, take up your cross, that's die and follow me because you don't get a resurrection without a death. And so Jesus said, come follow me, die to yourself, deny yourself and follow me. Life is not found in loving yourself or loving who or whatever you want. Life is found in loving who you were created to love. That is Jesus dying to yourself and being raised in Christ. Thomas went from fearless to faithless, then back to fearless. I don't know about you, it sounds a lot like my life sometimes. Fearless, then faithless, and back to fearless, then back to faithless. My prayer is today that convinced of the resurrection, you will be filled with resurrection power. Filled with that. Ephesians 1 says, that resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead, it will fill you, it will strengthen you, and it will make you fearless all over again. 
Here's my second takeaway. Believing brings blessing. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe even without seeing, they will be blessed. When you believe, when you follow Jesus, it's still a step of faith. It's a reasonable faith. But Jesus says, if you will believe, then I will bless your life. Even though you can't physically still see me, even though you can't physically see the answer to your doubt right now, believe in me. And if you do, I will bless your life. And one day your faith will be sight and you will see more than you ever could have possibly imagined. If you will believe in me, your believing will result in seeing. And here's what Paul said about believing and the blessing, the ultimate blessing that comes from believing. Paul said this in Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10. He said this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, that's that Jesus is God and you believe, there's that word. If you believe in your heart that God raised him, Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That's the ultimate blessing friends, that you will be saved. You'll be rescued from your sin, from the penalty of sin, which is death, eternity separated from God in a place called hell. You will be rescued from your sin. You will be saved for it is by believing, there it is, it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Paul says, when you believe in Jesus, that Jesus is God, that he is who he said he is, that he rose from the grave, when you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus, that's when your sin is forgiven, you're made right with God, and you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Notice that Paul didn't say, when you've worked harder, when you've done better, when you've tried harder, when you've come to church enough times, when you get baptized, when you take the Lord's Supper, when you clean yourself up a little bit, when, when you do all those things, then maybe you will be saved. No, Paul said, when you believe you will be saved because it's not based on what you can do, it's based upon what Jesus has done for you. It's not based, it's, it's not I'm going to do, it's that Jesus already did. And Paul says, when you trust in Jesus, you give your life to him, your sins forgiven, past, present, and future. You remain right with God and you can know for sure. You don't have to wonder because it's not based on you. You can be sure that when you die, you're going to heaven because your faith is in Jesus and what he has done for you on your behalf. And so if you're here today and you wanna give your life to Jesus, I would invite you to jump on our app, fill out our connect form and let us know that you're committing your life to Jesus today. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And Jesus promised, if you do, I'll bless you. You can believe, you can believe without seeing because Thomas believed after seeing and he was so convinced he was so convinced that he was willing to die for his Lord and Savior, Jesus. In John chapter six, I told you it starts with the feeding of the 5,000. Well, then Jesus starts preaching that he's the bread of life. He says, come eat for me, follow me, take up your cross, die to yourself and follow me. And the crowd begins to grumble, thousands upon thousands of them. Scholars believe it was actually closer to 15,000 when you count women and children. Thousands of people are grumbling and they're saying, this is a hard teaching. We can't handle this. And the crowd begins to thin and thousands upon thousands of people dwindle down to 12, 50, 100 people. Jesus was a pastor in our country, he would have been fired. Jesus looks at his 12, he said, everyone else has left me. Everyone else has left because the teaching got a little difficult. The call, the cost went up a little bit to keep going from here. You all started out as fans, but the fans have left. Are you going to turn away too? Or are you going to follow me? And I love what Peter says. Peter speaks up. He says, Jesus, we have nowhere else to go. We, we've done everything else. I, I mean, nothing else has ever satisfied us. Everything else has left us hungry and thirsty and longing for more. We, we've never met the satisfaction the so, that our soul is longing for. We, we, we've never experienced that until now. We, we have nowhere else to go, Peter says. You have the words of life. We believe, there's that word. We believe and know you, Jesus, are the Holy One of God. You are God. We have nowhere else to go. And so the disciples, believing that, 
believed that it was better to live and die for Christ than to waste their lives doing anything else. These men did not waste their lives as people have said, no, they lived good lives and they died good deaths. And they believe living for Christ and dying for Christ was better than wasting their life on anything else or anything less. This week marked the 76th anniversary of the hanging of Christian author, theologian, pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was hung as a martyr in 1945 by Hitler's Third Reich. He wrote a book before then called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he opens that book and writes this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Come follow me, Jesus said, take up your cross, die to yourself. Follow me. That's where life is found. It's better to live for Christ and die for Christ than to waste your life on anything else. God, I pray that right now in this moment, you would give us a passion to follow you regardless of the cost, regardless of the disappointments in this life because you have the words of life. You rose from the grave. No one else is worthy of our trust, our hope, our worship, our lives. And so in Jesus' name this morning, we are moving from fans to followers, from enthusiastic admirers to disciplined followers, to disciples. And so God, we pray this week, God, would you just even now move in our hearts and give us a passion for having the dust of our rabbi fall on our feet. In Jesus' name, amen.